All right. Um, our second speaker will be Clara, Mo Clara Morell, who is uh, finishing her PhD at MIT, or did you already graduate? It's in two weeks, uh, two weeks. hour for oh, hour. One week, sorry, next week, actually. Yes. All right. <laughs> Good luck with that defense coming up. Um, and today, Clara will be sharing a bunch of her thesis research, which involves bridging the gap between spacecraft magnetometry investigations and laboratory experiments using iron meteorites. So we're going from micromagnetism to planetesimal sized magnetism. All right, take it away. Yes. Thanks, Sonia. So uh, I want to start by echoing Raman and thanking you, the conveners and the organizers for inviting me and for me, uh, I, I'm very happy to show you the, the results of this uh, late, latest work. And yes, it is the least to say that I'm going to talk about a much coarser scale here, but uh, let's get to it. So, um, so this project, um, uh, the ambition of this project was to uh, be an attempt to connect the dots between what we can measure magnetically in the lab on meteorites and what we can measure in space uh, on asteroids. And um, the motivation behind this work was a very simple observation. Um, on the one hand, uh, we've sent a number of magnetometers in space uh, to measure the magnetic fields of asteroids of the kilometer in the kilometer size range. And turns out that none of these space missions have found a reliable evidence for a magnetized asteroid. Now, if we turn to the uh, smaller scale, millimeter, micrometer, nanometer scale uh, of meteorites, we see a more divided picture. There are some studies that show that some meteorites do not uh, carry a natural remnant magnetization or are not magnetized. But there are some others that have shown that some meteorites can be magnetized and that this natural remnant magnetization is not the product of contamination on Earth, but predates the arrival on Earth. For example, post potential sources of, of magnetizing fields are the fields generated by the parent bodies of, of those uh, meteorites. So there seems to be an apparent discrepancy between what we can measure in the lab and what we can measure in space. However, there may be a lot of explanation to, to that apparent discrepancy. The most obvious one uh, perhaps is sample bias. Maybe we've just visited asteroids that were not magnetized and that's it. Another possibility is that um, some physical processes act uh, at randomizing the magnetization on asteroid. And the most straightforward one we can think about is during those 4.5 billion years of collisional history, some asteroids may have been disrupted, re-accreted randomly. And of course, you can imagine that, that the magnetization may not have, may have been randomized by such processes. Uh, but for this work, we, we uh, wanted to ask perhaps an even more basic, uh, pose a more basic assumption and ask a basic question, one that we could actually um, um, work on in the lab. And it was, um, the question was, does the size of the objects that we are measuring that this kilometer size scale prevent us from actually detecting any magnetization of these asteroids? And the, the question that was the root question for our project was, can we um, actually describe, understand how the bulk magnetization of, in our case, extraterrestrial material evolve as you measure bigger and bigger objects? So uh, before showing you some data, I thought it would be interesting to gain some intuition with what I think is the most simplest model that will be mentioned in this conference. Um, here, I simply added vectors together, um, vectors associated with a unit volume, and I calculated the magnitude of the resultant of those vectors. So that's what you're going to see on the y-axis versus size on the x-axis. Now this very simple uh, addition gives you two extreme cases. Um, the first one is if all the vectors are aligned together. In that case, as you calculate the magnitude of the resultant with size, it is going to be constant. On the other hand, if all the vectors are randomly uh, added together, you can calculate analytically that the resultant of the mag the magnitude of the resultant is going to follow uh, one over square root of v uh, slope. Um, 
Now, if you vary the fraction of uniformly oriented vectors that you add to your system, you can see that the, magni the magnitude of the resultant is going to decrease with size, but also that is going to asymptote to what actually represents the magnitude of the uniform component of the total um, resultant of the, the sum of the vectors. So, of course, this extremely simple model may be way too simple to um, apply to the complexity of, of what we find in nature, yet it, it proposes simple observations that we may be able to test. Perhaps um, as you go from a meteorite to an asteroid, uh, the magnetization is still on this slope decaying and therefore is going to be way too low as you arrive at the kilometer size object and you will not be able to detect it. Or perhaps much at much smaller scale, you're already plateauing at this asymptote that I just mentioned. So we're going to see from there what, what we can just do by comparing some data to this very little uh, model. So the first thing that we wanted to test was this idea of uh, asymptotic behavior to the magnetization. And for this, uh, I used a very uh, specific meteorite, which is here represented, uh, Techado. And the reason why we chose this meteorite is because we conducted an independent paleomagnetic investigation on this object uh, a few years ago. And uh, during this investigation, we looked at uh, what we call cloudy zones that are structures that are contained in the metal of this meteorite. So as a, a, a reminder, perhaps uh, cloudy zones are micron scale ensembles of these uh, 100 nanometers islands that you see here on this picture. And um, those uh, islands are known to be uh, uh, good uh, magnetic recorders and we use them in, in paleomagnetic investigations of iron meteorites. We looked at these cloudy zones using uh, X-ray photoemission electron microscopy or XPIM. And uh, in two words, what XPIM gives you access to is uh, the direction of the average magnetization of the cloudy zone. So what we found in this study was that the cloudy zone in Techado uh, are uniformly magnetized. Um, we looked at several of these cloudy zones and there were, uh, their average magnetization was pointing in the same direction. So we could use this result to try to extrapolate it to the bulk scale and see whether we could predict very simply the asymptote that a bulk sample of the shadow would, uh, would um, plateau to. For this, we make a couple of assumptions. We assume that only the cloud zone in the sample are carrying the, the uniform component of the magnetization. Uh, from the samples we measure, we estimate roughly what's the volume fraction represented by the cloud zone, and we calculate what is the, the bulk magnetization uh, of these uniformly oriented cloud zone to estimate the asymptote for larger sample. So that's what we did. Uh, here you have a plot of magnetization versus size um, in log scale, and this brown bound here is uh, the, the back of the envelope estimate of the asymptote that I just mentioned. And we measured uh, two sizes of samples for this one, a millimeter cube sample with the 2G and then a centimeter cube uh, sample that is the one that is represented here uh, and estimated their uh, remnant magnetization. And what you can see is that the very simple uh, conclusion that we can make of that is that um, this little back of the envelope calculation seem to be in agreement with at least what we can measure for this meteorite which is that the slopes seem to be very shallow and could potentially asymptote at bigger scale to, to, this, to, this, little, uh, to this asymptote that we calculated. Of course, uh, one motivation of this work was actually uh, to go beyond uh, what we can easily measure in the lab and to go beyond the centimeter scale. We wanted to measure, uh, to push the boundaries of the size of the, uh, the samples that we uh, can measure. And for this, uh, thanks to the very uh, impressive work of a master student, Elise Clavé, who worked with us for uh, six months, we designed and built a two meter size portable magnetometer array uh, that we brought to the, uh, the, the uh, Smithsonian Institution to measure some of their biggest specimen of uh, iron meteorites. Um, so this magnetometer is made of uh, two pairs of Helmholtz coils that allow you to control the magnetic field inside the system. 
Here is perhaps a better view to, to give you a few details about the structure. You obviously have the meteorites uh, at the center of the system. These things weighed like half a ton. So they were brought to us on forklifts, which was pretty impressive. Um, then you have the coils here. Uh, the wires are in green so that you can uh, better see the coils. And then we had a set of four flux gate magnetometer that were attached to a rail that we could move around the sample. So we positioned it on four sides of the sample as well as above in order to have 20 different locations where we measured the magnetic field inside the system and have sort of a decent coverage of the magnetic field. Uh, now, the goal of this instrument was to measure or estimate the remnant magnetic moment of the meteorite. But we faced a big challenge, which was that unlike small samples, we didn't have a very nice and powerful shield to shield our meteorites from any ambient field that was around, starting with the Earth's field, obviously. So the field that we measure uh, inside the system would, uh, the field that we measure uh, uh, from the meteorite would then be the sum of the remnant component, but as well as an induced component. So in an ideal world, uh, you could use the, the Helmholtz score system to completely cancel out the uh, outside field and therefore only measure the remnant component. However, we all know that in practice, nothing works as uh, ideally expected. And so we had to bypass some challenges. And let me just explain to you a little bit how we did. So there are two quantities that we're interested in. The first one is the applied field, which is the sum of the ambient field. So the earth and anything else that was around in, in the uh, museum support center and the coil, uh, the field generated by the coils. And we also measured the sample field, which is the difference at each flux gate, which is the difference between uh, the field measure when the meteorite is inside and when the meteorite is not. Now we did that at each flux gate position, we measured the components of the sample field for different applied fields and obtained data that looks like this, which were the sum of the remnant and induced components. Fitting a line through this, you can estimate roughly what the uh, sample field at zero applied field is and obtain an estimate of the remnant component of the, uh, the meteorite field. Using this remnant field uh, components and the position of the flux gate, uh, we input, we, uh, input this uh, data, this information into a, a multiple inversion model that we created for this purpose and we uh, estimate the magnetic moment. Now to test whether all this system and uh, all this pipeline worked, uh, we used a known sample, a magnet for which we knew with relatively good precision what the magnetic moment was to see if we could actually find the same magnetic moment. So just to show you an example of data, uh, this is the sample field components for one flux gate position. So you see that we uh, get a decently linear relationship between sample field and applied field. Fitting the line through this, we get an estimate of the remnant field components. We did that for all 20 flux gate position that you have in the x-axis and the three, and you obtain the three uh, components of the remnant field. So those are the gray points. Now our um, a multiple inversion model did use those data and fit them to estimate the magnetic moment of the magnet. And it turns out that we found a magnetic moment that encompassed the true value with very decent to our standard uh, uh, uncertainties. And so uh, we, we were pretty confident that we could use that for bigger samples that we don't know anything about. Okay, so now let's go back to uh, the questions that we had at the beginning. We wanted to see how the magnetization evolved with size and we pushed the boundary to the meter uh, scale this time. Uh, we looked at four meteorites available at the Smithsonian Institution uh, names in Navajo, Cranbourne, Casas Corinthians, and Queen Canyon. You will see here magnetization versus volume uh, on the same scale for all plots. Uh, just as a guide for the eye, here are the ranges of size that we met, uh, for which we use different instruments. So the 2G for the smallest sample, a spinner, different spinners, magnetometers for centimeter size samples, tens of centimeter, and then the array for the biggest one. So here are our data, and I will walk you through a few uh, observations that we made uh, along the way. 
The first observation is if you plot a, a line that has a slope of one over square root of v. And what you can see is that none of those meteorites, and Techeta was the same, uh, follow this random magnetization lines, which suggests to us, based on our intuition of this model, that all the meteorites appear to asymptote to value that is not zero, and therefore their slope is not going to follow this one over square root of v line. Now the origin and the value of this uniform, the magnitude of this uniform component are another story to, to figure out. Um, so I will divide those meteorites into two groups uh, that have similar behavior. And we'll start with Navarro and Cromborn, which have very flat slopes as size increases. Um, and so it seems like they are already asymptoting, even at the centimeter scale, they seem to be already uh, on their, their asymptote. So to try to investigate what was the origin of this uniform component that we seem to recognize in those data, uh, we, in particular, conducted VRM acquisition experiments, which were propagated in time to estimate what could be the upper limit on the VRM component acquired by those meter size things. And uh, here you have the upper limit as well as the uh, uh, range that is compatible with VRM acquisition. And you can see two contrasting results. On the one hand, Cranborn is compatible with um, its uniform component being simply a VRM acquired on it. Um, but on the other hand, uh, Navajo can clearly not be explained by a VRM component, uh, which is orders of magnitude lower. We also made small calculations to estimate whether you could completely remagnetize by sticking magnets all over those meteorites. However, the magnetization is still very high and difficult to explain with that. So with that little data, we could not go further than this. So investigate further what would be the origin of this uniform component in Navarro. Uh, most likely it is a source of contamination we haven't thought of, although we can always entertain the possibility that, that this uniform component predates arrival on Earth. Cannot say much further. If we turn to Casas Grandis and Queen Canyon now, we see a different behavior. We see that even at the meter scale, they appear to not be asymptoting yet which is contrasting with other meteorites, which seem to be already at their asymptote at much smaller scale. The VRM component is lower than the bigger uh, meteorites magnetization. And our interpretation, uh, of course, always open of these data, is that they may both be asymptoting to a VRM component uh, or any other uniform component. Um, and the fact that they are still on a slope at the meter scale might be that uh, multiple overprints created heterogeneities in the magnetization of samples at the smaller scale. Again, data were limited to those data points and it was difficult to go a little further. Now with all those data, um, I, I sort of made the promise that we would talk about asteroids there. So I think it's time to uh, take a little perspective. Um, and actually, uh, what I wanted to mention is, is uh, yet another motivation uh, for this work, uh, for the reason why we, we try this, this uh, adventure. And the reason is a forthcoming mission that is called Psyche, and which is going to visit a meta-rich asteroid of the same name uh, in 2026. And what the mission is going to test is whether Psyche is, uh, can be a piece of the core of an ancient planetary body. And one investigation that is going to be conducted is a magnetometry investigation to search for a remnant magnetization at the asteroid and traces of ancient, perhaps, dynamo activity. Now, collaborators of the Psyche mission are conducting actively MHD simulation to try to anticipate as much as possible what we could find if Psyche was magnetized and the spacecraft was arriving and orbiting it. So you have just here, as an illustration, uh, an example of those MFG simulation of a magnetized Psyche interacting with the solar wind. Colors, everything, it doesn't really matter, it's really just for an illustration. My point being here is that those simulation must uh, take some constraint constraints from somewhere. And what they have been based on so far is from the measurements of iron meteorites that were conducted at the millimeter or centimeter scale. And they used for kilometer-sized boulders 
a magnetization range of millimeter size objects. So one motivation of our work was also to say, well, is this even relevant? Can you use those range of magnetization at such a bigger scale? So I promised to take some perspective and, and look back. So here is the same plot, magnetization versus size. You have our data in the upper left of the plot. And uh, here is Psyche. So it is more than 14 orders of magnitudes larger than the biggest meteorite we will be able to measure on Earth. So of course, everything I'm going to say now is, is a little bit of speculation, but it's always fun to do. Um, and it's uh, as a reference, also, you have here the latest uh, magneto magnetometry investigations conducted by other spacecraft. These are upper limits on the magnetization. No magnetization was detected, but this is the minimum they could detect. So everything is going to be lower than this. This is, again, just as a reference. Um, the spacecraft, uh, Psyche, is going to be able to measure, uh, detect magnetization down to 10 to the minus 5 ampermeter square per kilogram. And I plotted here the parameter space that was swept by the simulations. So simulations were simulating um, kilometer, 20 kilometers or bigger boulders assembled together to make a psyche. And then they were giving it uh, a magnetization uh, in order to estimate what would be the bulk magnetization of the asteroid. Now, um, here, uh, the the only thing that we can make is just like very simple observation by comparing what we got at the very small scale and, and what is at the other end of the plot. For example, if you plot this very, this uh, back of the envelope calculation uh, asymptote that we calculated for Techado and assume that Psyche is made of uh, big boulders of Techados, well, what our data tell us, if we are correct with this assumption that a bigger sample would asymptote at this value, that the simulations are not so wrong at using a range of uh, at using the range of magnetization they're using uh, to simulate bigger boulders. Um, the other uh, example we can take is Casas Grandis, for which we couldn't figure out because lack of data at larger scale where it would be asymptoting. So it could be that if Psyche was a big Casas Grandis could still be detectable, but we also see the limitations where like uh, a bigger Casas Grandis could fall way outside the, the measurement limit of Psyche. So of course, given this 1400, 14 order of magnitude extrapolation between the data, we can only make very humble observations, but it seems like those simulations so far are compatible with the data that we added to, to the picture. So if I can uh, summarize uh, everything I've said and perhaps uh, give some future ideas, we've seen that uh, it seems like a size increases magnetization of extraterrestrial material or not asymptotes to a uniform, its uniform component. This very simple model suggested to it, but our data appear to be consistent with that. Um, we've also seen with the case of the shadow that we can use micros what we know at the micro scale to uh, estimate what we should be able to see at the larger scale uh, on an, a meteorite. And finally, our measurements, as I just mentioned, support the numerical investigations for Psyche, but also I think give uh, broader new, perhaps new avenues of uh, uh, interesting simulations to run, uh, to build this database of possible Psyches. Now, what's, what would be next? Um, so if you listen to my advisor, Ben Weiss, uh, the next is to measure the biggest meteorite that exists on Earth. That's, that's very Ben Weiss to say. <laughs> um, he's sitting on that meteorite right here on this picture. Uh, this is the Hoba iron meteorite, weighed 60 ton. So um, that was his dream. I don't know if it's going to happen ever, but might as well uh, try. Uh, if we're a little bit less dreamy, but uh, not um, least interesting, I think it would be uh, very interesting to test this null hypothesis, um, measure non-magnetized sample as they get bigger and see whether we actually find this one over square root of V-line. I think this would give interesting insights. And I think also it would be great to do this exercise with different types of meteorites, in particular, the one matching the asteroids that we've visited, because so far we haven't visited an iron meteorite-like asteroid. And for example, this asteroid Yorgu that's been visited by the Hayabusa 2 mission, 
the, the, the mission just brought back to Earth samples from the asteroid. So combining what we could learn from those meteorite study, the sample returned to Earth and the magnetometry data, I think would be a wonderful um, uh, new door open to try to better understand this uh, scaling of magnetization with size. And finally, my last word would be that um, we hope that this instrument as coarse as it can be, may have some other application, uh, perhaps uh, for rock magnetism on Earth, uh, but that is not my uh, area of expertise. Um, so thank you for listening. Uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you for that great talk. All right, I'm trying to look in the participants tab to see if we have any questions so far. I might open with one. Um, so, oh, or Rich, were you raising your hand? Yeah, go uh, for it. Yeah, oh, thanks. Oh, brilliant talk, Clara. Really, really, really fascinating uh, study. Um, so I was, my question is about the, the lens scale of whatever's causing randomization. So you have a, you have a kind of a constant magnetization component which gives you your asymptote, and you then have some other element of your meteorite, which is creating randomization. Uh, I mean, does it matter what, yeah, is the assumption that that length scale of randomization is the same across your various orders of magnitude? So I'm thinking about like a, a you know, a, like a rubble pile asteroid parent body where you might have, you know, meters, uh, boulders, which may be uniformly magnetized, but when they, you know, become a rubble pile, you have randomization on a much larger length scale. Does, do, yeah. do your calculations take? No, yeah, I think you're pointing to the, the uh, a very good question, because I almost forgot the fact that, yes, you could have different physical processes that create this randomization. It could be like a very physical process when you take the boulder, put it somewhere like in another direction, like a rubble pile. And yes, uh, of course, none of these straight line that I plotted on, on this uh, big, large scale uh, plot would, would follow. You would perhaps have an asymptote and then depending on your assemblage, you would get a much lower magnetization. But for, for the spacecraft point of view, I think it would still be, I think thinking in that sense would still be interesting if you don't measure anything. And if with other instruments, you can get information about the structure of your asteroid, then in that case, the lack of magnetization combined with other gravity measurements or structural measurements mm -hmm. would give you some information. There are also probably smaller scale, even on the meter uh, size, of course, you could have a big meteorite with like a 50 centimeter inclusions of non-magnetic material. Um, that could also be the case. You could have someone sticking a huge magnet on one side, but on on the other. Um, and of course, if you go at the much smaller scale, you have well, very much smaller scale, you have all the multi-domain randomization, okay. but that is beyond, I think, what we, we've looked at. And just a follow, quick follow-up, I mean, the Psyche mission, well, that presumably, depending on how close the spacecraft gets to the body, will be able to look at magnetization on different lens scales. So maybe yeah. you, could it be that if you got close enough, you might still pick up signals that you wouldn't if you were further away? That would be, that will be indeed very interesting. I think the spacecraft does go from like more than 200 kilometers to less than uh, like 80 kilometers, I think is the closest approach that's gonna be made. Uh, and yes, you will, uh, I think at best be able to resolve those uh, 20 kilometer um, spatial resolution, I think on the asteroid. So yes, you'll definitely be able to compare uh, the different scales yeah we'll find out <laughs> yes <laughs> a few years left <laughs> thanks claire that was such a great talk i think and one of the reasons i like it is because we're always talking about how to go smaller and smaller and smaller but sometimes it makes sense to take a step back and think about why we might need to go bigger 